Drummers I Like podcast, episode number 12. Hey drummers, just want to plug you guys on the new Drummers I Like contest, the Whose Kit Is That contest. That's right, every day we're posting kits of your favorite drummers, seeing who can figure it out who it is first. For more details on the contest, just visit drummersilike.net. All right, guys, here we go. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Richard Ducat, coming out of Santa Monica, the official office for Drummers I Like. And on the other line, I got my co-host, Kevin, coming out of Barrow Beach, Florida. What's up, Kevin? What's going on? Hanging out in Florida, waiting to see if these storms are going to spin into our lovely state that sticks out like a sore thumb or not here. F you, dude. It never rains in Los Angeles, and... As I've said before on the podcast, my favorite part about Florida are those gloomy, rainy days that happen so frequently. Yeah. You know, but whenever there's something out there spinning up, you know, you always have a little in the back of your mind. You're always like, man, I hope this thing doesn't get big. It isn't. I mean, how many storms get like, like I was 16 yeah. the last time we had big storms in Vero Beach, which were the hurricanes that uh -huh. I'm sure just like we live so close to each other. You probably didn't have power for two months either. Yeah, it was pretty much the same. It's pretty rare when, uh, when uh, you know, you have two hurricanes that make landfall within five miles of each other in two weeks. So for those of you out there who uh, who are not familiar with our crazy storm year, I can't remember. Was it 06? No. It was, it was before that. 04? Uh, I think it was 04. But, yeah, it was a, it was a crazy year for us Floridians. So yeah, no fun. fun. I was younger now, onto the you, show. So, yeah, I was younger than you, so I got to play and get out of school. You still had to go to work, probably. <laughs> you know, I did. I did. I had to go in the day after and shovel out silt from the parts department of a car dealership I worked at. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, enough rain and Florida talk. Why don't you tell us who we're bringing on the show today, dude? Today, we have the great honor of having Mr. Travis Orban on. I mean... That name says it all. We're so happy to get him booked on the show and uh, and to be able to chat with him. And uh, we can't wait to hear what he has to say. I mean, he's yeah. he's a monster. I mean, I, I, I can't get enough of him when I watch him. So Yeah, no real intro needed for Orban. If you play drums, you know the name. So <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, you know, you guys heard that plug in the beginning for that uh, contest for the Amazon gift card. Go to drummersalect.net and check that out. And without further ado, let's get this show started. You ready to go, Kevin? Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Drummers I Like podcast. We are freaking excited for today's episode. This is episode 12, and today's guest is the amazing Travis Orban. Travis is a session musician currently playing with Darkest Hour. He's also the ex-member of one of my favorite bands of all time, Skate's Airplane. His sponsors are Pearl Drums, Zildjian, Vic Firth, Remo Drumheads, and E-Pad Practice Pads. Travis, it is awesome to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. No problem. So, in like all episodes of Drummers I Like, it is in our nature to have you give us a little uh, in-depth backstory on yourself, how you got into drums, how you got to where you are now, and uh, you know some details about your story in between. All right. Um, definitely answered this question a few times, so hopefully it doesn't come out too stilted. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I always felt like an inherent uh, sense of enthrallment with uh, rhythm. Before I even knew that I wanted to be a drummer, I was beating on desks all the time in elementary school for no real, you know, explicable reason. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, got in trouble a lot, and then finally uh, I discovered Metallica, and probably like a lot of people my age, when the Black Album came out, and they just, you know, destroyed the world and took it over, <laughs> and so I got into them, but still I didn't get the fanciful notion that I wanted to be a drummer until I took some of my hard-earned money and I bought the And Justice For All cassette, and uh, that's when it hit me that I wanted to play drums, that album just 
you know, changed me. <laughs> yeah, what a great album. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it does something to me even now that I, that nothing else does, especially metal. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, and then uh, after that, um, I started like I don't know, I guess air drumming a lot, and <laughs> like the idea that I wanted to actually play the drums it hit me. And so I told my parents, and they uh, started me off slow at first. My dad got me a practice pad, and then they got me uh, this really cheap little synthesizer kit. And, uh, you know, without, you know, invariably, I would play them every day and do, you know, experiment, do whatever I could until I got bored. And then finally, in uh, 1995, for my birthday slash Christmas gift, <laughs> I got a Pearl Export kit with uh, two Zildjian Amir symbols and a cooler as a throne. <laughs> <laughs> a cooler, I like that. Yeah. So that's the the very beginning. Um, should I keep going? Absolutely. <laughs> so after that, I was self-taught for a year, and I just played to uh, the radio. You know, Radio Rock at the time was really happening. You had Nirvana and... Soundgarden, all that that great last wave of rock bands, and then uh, after a year of being very dedicated, my parents realized it wasn't just another sort of uh, phase that kids go through. Yeah. And then they got me; <clears throat> they started me with uh, private lessons uh, for my gift the next year. <laughs> oh. So I took uh, private lessons with a man named Honey Bochelle in. Dover, Delaware, well, close to Dover, and uh, did that for several years. Taught me a lot of fundamentals, uh, most notably, of course, the ability to read drums, drum set sheet music, which is indispensable even to this day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so amidst all that, I started playing with as many people in the area as I could, locally, regionally, and then... Uh, I don't know. It's, it just seemed like one door just kind of led to another, and then before I knew it, I was I was in periphery, and then out of periphery came Skyhead's airplane and blah blah blah. So it just kind of you know, it was a snowball effect, I guess. Awesome, man. And I, you know, clearly, I guess that's led to now what, which is uh, your main pat project, uh, or your main tour, I guess, touring project, which is Darkest Hour. But you're you're doing a lot of session playing and. You know what? What what's what's kind of on the list right now for the artists that you find yourself playing with? Is it is it in the metal rock area, or are you kind of all over the map? Um, it's definitely all over the map. Right now on the docket, I'd say I have more. I have more stuff that lean leans towards metal, but I'm I just now finished a rock record, straight up rock record, no screaming you know, hooks, everything. So, um, it's, yeah, it's a little all over the place. That's really cool. That's, that's good. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's fundamental as a drummer to really be, you know, playing all different languages, like as maybe as you call it of drums, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of easy to get stuck in one genre these days for some drummers. Absolutely. I mean, uh, my recreational listening tastes are very diverse. So, I don't know, naturally my playing, you know, my playing, uh, what I desire to play, you know, I, I, uh, seek diversity as well. Absolutely. Are you, um, are you doing the writing for all the Darkest Hours stuff as they write too? Of course. Yeah. We're, we're doing the, um, <clears throat> just like we did the last one. Sure. We get, we get in a room together. We have some, uh, some demos that are fleshed out, but, uh we get in the room and actually play them and just by the sheer act of doing that you know new ideas arise and and so we just kind of bounce around for a bit and then we take like a rough demo take down a rough demo of the song and then our one guitarist Mike Schleibaum fires that out to everyone and then I plug in my parts to uh, Guitar Pro and send him a MIDI basically the same process that I adhere to for session work i see and then uh we'll plug that into i don't know i think he has drum kit from from hell or superior drummer one of those 
and then uh, then we have and then re-records guitars, and then we have like a real working demo of the song, and then we can, you know, tweak it some more. That's right. I see. Start so you to really dig in. Right. Yeah, so you, you really get take, yeah. You get you get the best of both worlds, uh, which I really like. You get that organic, you know, composition, and then you get that uh, that more uh, critiquing, a little more sterile approach. <laughs> But it, it's good, you know. That's awesome. How would you, um, you know, say your writing process is for, you know, the band you're playing with full time versus your session playing? Do you do you take the same approach for writing, or is it is it different? It's definitely different. Um, with the band, just my first thought is with the band, I can actually fight for ideas, you know. <laughs> yeah. Session work, you kind of got to listen. You got to listen to the musician and and do what they what they kind of want to hear too. Yeah, they can veto anything at any time, and that's their right. Sure. So, uh, but as far as I don't know, as far as uh, just writing the parts, it's 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 similar. It's comparable. Um, you know, uh, with the band, I try to toe the line of the band's established sound as well as uh, obviously my identity, what I want to express, and then also what's best for the song. So when it comes to, to session work, it's basically the same thing, unless the band or project doesn't have a, an enormous amount of history, you know? Yeah. Now, now would you say your session work, um, the bulk of your session work, do you, are you given charts that are already kind of pre-charted out for you to go through, or are you getting to create quite a bit when you do your session work? Well, I've never done a single session wherein I didn't write drum parts okay. or, cha or change them to some degree. Uh, there are some sessions where I, I there's more of a creation aspect. Uh, for example, the band Died in Grey. Um, I did probably half their first album all of this five song ep and then uh, i guess about half maybe more of the album that i'm working on now with them uh with nothing but two guitars uh maybe bass as well but no drums whatsoever so okay. you know obviously that in that impelled me to write 100 percent original parts which i really like because uh and it always just turns up different you know the song sounds different than what everyone's interpretation may have been sure. um but i'd say at least 50 percent, if not more of the sessions have some kind of program drums in them so i just kind of i regard those as more so as a placeholder for the feel of the section like say if there's a program drums with a heavy backbeat on the two and four, then okay, that's the feel that they want in that session. That section, but uh, you know, as far as what kick hits the play or uh, any other sort of bells and whistles, you know, that that's all up to me. Okay. So you're given a lot. You're given a lot of leeway when you're doing your session stuff. It's not like it's not like you're getting a chart and it's like, oh, you got to, you know, it's not like like back when Zappa used to give his drummer stuff and it's like, you better play this and it better be exactly like this. <laughs> it depends again on the session. Uh, sure. I've gotten some some guys that are pretty pretty married to the uh, the ideas that they have in place, but uh, for the most part, yeah, I'm given quite a bit of leeway. That's great. That's, that's I, I guess people. They kind of know what to expect, or they're hiring me for a reason, so they welcome that that contribution. But you know, if someone wants to to hire me to play everything that they wrote, then I'll do that. Sure. <laughs> like if I nine, nine times, yeah, nine times out of ten, if they're gonna if they're gonna say, well, we're gonna try and get Travis Orban to do these drum parts, they're probably gonna want you to put your stamp on it too, because that's that's why they want you on it. Precisely. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah, I'm definitely thankful for that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you've got you've got that that unique that unique sound, and and uh, you know it's it's so enjoyable to watch uh, watch you play. It's just smooth as class, and you've got you've got such a six a, a awesome skill set. You know, thank you kindly. No worries, man. There's a, there's a lot of drummers looking up to you out there. So yeah, I gotta kind of I kind of kind of going back in history for a second because when I first heard of you, Travis, I was. 
which was periphery, by the way. I first started in periphery. I was in college, and I was watching, like, fucking play all these crazy parts online. And then all of a sudden, all these videos of the uh, Skites Airplane stuff started popping up. You playing Machines. You playing um, that crazy freaking song at the very end of that main album with uh, all the sh- super fast double bass parts. I think it's, uh, I don't recall the name of it, but I, I know you know what I'm talking about. I think that was Disconnected, and, um, right? <clears throat> yeah, Disconnected, yeah. that song. <laughs> Um, wa- watching you play those really inspired me, and not not only did it inspire me to want to go learn those songs that I could not play, but your setup was so different to me at the time. And I think being a drummer that did not grow up in drums, not knowing a lot of the original drummers of the past that were experimenting with drum setups and you know different placement of the uh, kit, it was it was kind of the first time I've ever seen someone racking their toms on the left and not having the traditional you know one up on one on the floor setup. Um, how would you say though that over maybe the last six or seven years, has that changed at all as you've went from different artists and different session playing? Because, you know, as of now, it seems like you're still really playing that setup for the most part, but do you ever have maybe find people asking you to switch it up or you just wanting to switch it up yourself for a little different bit of playing? I've found that uh, I can express, you know, what I want to express and what people pay me to express i guess <laughs> uh i can do all that with with my kit and uh i've definitely added some things uh depending on the session uh even added a tom in uh i think it was the last cyclamen session that i did um and when i go when i do sessions out of my friend taylor larson's studio he has a you know, a very conventional, traditional setup, just a regular four-piece kit, and I have no, you know, no qualms, no problems playing that. Sure. But uh, as far as my own studio setup, it just just kind of stays in one place. I don't want to move anything because everything sounds good, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know that. I know that. <laughs> so, yeah. uh... The- just kind yeah. of a question related to to kind of your you know your setup. What, what kind of inspired you to kind of start taking that symmetrical kind of outlook? You know, I mean, I know guys have been messing with it for a long time, and you'll see guys that do kind of more of the real rigid symmetrical, where it's like you know hi hat in front with the snare directly there, and then everything is kind of mocked on on both sides. But you kind of you kind of change that up. But what kind of inspired you to start doing that? Um, a lot of factors coming together it wasn't an overnight decision but uh way back in i think it was like 2003 maybe 2004 uh when i was still gigging with a a traditional setup just a four or five piece kit set up in a typical fashion with the drums in front uh i I got to this late this gig in particular uh late and i was actually taking my drums like out of the bags and putting them on stage like that late (laughs) and and on a whim i just decided to play the gig with a three-piece kit kick snare floor tom and uh, i liked it it was it was challenging to adjust everything on the fly it was you know mentally stimulating and i thought hey maybe i'm on to something here but i wanted to add something to promote more left hand movement but at the time it, it was it was kind of convenient, I guess, because at the time I, I always felt that my performance, my live performance suffered because I can never get everything set up in time. And obviously it didn't help that uh, I was playing all these like DIY style gigs where there's where the you know venues overbooked and everyone has five minutes to change over. <laughs> oh, I, I just went through that last weekend. <laughs> just went through that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. Oh yeah, yeah. The last band couldn't play, and it's like, oh, you book oh, nine geez. bands, and you got, and you gotta, you gotta figure that it's gonna be more than fifteen minutes to really break down and and set up. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I played enough of those gigs where I just got fed up, and and this setup was convenient in that way. And uh, as far as the left hand component, I added a. At first, it was an auxiliary snare, because uh-huh. it was a very easy very quick thing to set up and get into a comfortable place and then basically with time that just evolved into a, a tom because i you know i i don't play in a drum and bass band so yeah right <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to use a 12 inch snare and a 14 inch snare but uh which is also ironic because i just tracked a song for that rock band that i mentioned uh their name is barricades at night by the way and uh i actually used the hybrid setup with a 
a deep 8 by 14 snare on the left. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, that that changed into a rack tom. And so I basically, I had like, I guess, well, yeah, that's the core setup. But then this symmetrical symbol thing, that didn't really uh, kick in until I took a massive interest in Mike Mangini's playing. Oh, okay. And uh, first it was a little more mechanical than that. Like, I just wanted to add a hi-hat on the right to promote more left foot movement. But then once I took interest in Mike and saw that he used the cymbals in a, in a melodic way, like he set them up purposefully so that one side's like lower in pitch and one side's higher. Uh, you know, I took an interest in that and started, you know, got married to that setup and started trying to express myself through that. And it just stuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's cool. I, I've, you know, I've seen it quite a few times through the years where guys will do symmetrical stuff and it's, you know, the, the craziest I've ever gotten is just doing one floor time. But, uh, you know, I, I have a good friend of mine, uh, a kid named Nick, who's kind of from our, our East, uh, kind of east central coast of florida here where i'm calling from and uh he's playing in a band Fairlux actually and uh and he does a, a, a very similar setup to you he just puts a kind of a like a 14 inch floor tom on the left and he'll do a 16 on the right and his symbols aren't he doesn't do it like a symmetrical setup he doesn't do the right hand the right hand hi-hat but you've definitely you've definitely rubbed off on him a little bit on there and uh it's pretty cool to see a little bit a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little that's bit. cool that's actually what i use in the darkest hour i use a 14 Floor tom on the left and a okay. sixteen on the right. Yeah, that's uh, and and I love that you're playing with Darkest Hour. I've followed those guys for a long time, and uh, and, cool. and you really bring something to that band. That's really really fun to hear. Thanks. Uh, we're doing in a, a our ninth album. Well, not my ninth, their ninth, but my second. <laughs> hmm, sure. Uh, we're recording next month. Huh. So. Do you guys have anything in the work for tour wise or? Uh, we just announced a very short run with Guar of all bands. Oh, that's that's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that's going down late in October. Okay. And then uh, from there, we have some stuff taking shape for next year. But the main focus is you know recording and releasing the album, and it's it's going to be a big focus because this is the first independent venture of the band's entire career. So. Okay. We got to give it that proper rollout, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we'll be looking forward to kind of keeping track of what's going on, and we'll make sure we have all all any sort of info on on uh, what you guys are going to be doing that you've announced uh, in our show notes here, so all the listeners can check it out. And, and uh, you know, if they're if you're going to be around them for that short run, you know, they can try and get out and see you. Cool. That any, any, good. Anything coming to Florida? Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's all kind of. Uh, upper east coast okay yeah i see uh virginia philadelphia new york and dc okay. yeah we're we'll mid-atlantic <laughs> we'll just have to wait to get out and see you again yeah we'll get you one of these yeah days, next year there will be much more touring sure so likelihood is high we'll definitely be looking out for that definitely looking out for that well i guess you know, we'll we'll met, we'll mention it to you. This is uh this is kind of a fun thing that we've been doing with a uh, with a lot of our guests. But um, the the beat loft had a I don't know if you've ever come across it, but the beat loft had kind of a perfect timing game, where uh you know you'd load the game on a on a desktop or a laptop computer screen, and you know it plays like a click at a you know at a set BPM, and you have to like press a mouse button or a keyboard button and try and keep the time and then the the click kind of gradually goes away and you've got to kind of keep it on your own and it grades you and uh, one thing we've been doing with our guests is well we either get them the link to be able to do it live with us or if they're not able to do that we just get them the link so they can play and uh, we've been trying to kind of keep track of the scores and letting some of the fans kind of you know see if they can keep up with their favorite drummers and uh so we'll have to send you the link and see see what you could do i don't know if you're on a mobile device or not right now but <clears throat> I'm on my laptop. I can I can do this. <laughs> what was I just sent it oh, to you? Oh, did you? Actually. Okay, I great. <laughs> I got it. Should I should I go for it? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do, do it. it. Let's do it live. All right. The immortal words of Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> here here's here here's my tip. If you if if you uh you want to choose between mouse and keyboard, I would use the keyboard. What can you press? Spacebar. Okay, I got it. Any that. key. 
I was kind of distracted. Oh, it takes away. Um, eight seventy two. There we go. That's out of a thousand. So, and it's pretty hard to be be absolutely perfect. I mean, I don't. I don't think. I don't think anybody's gotten close to absolutely perfect. So, plus I was talking to you guys. That's right. See, <laughs> we distracted. I was about to mention that. I was about to mention that. Oh, and you're just like casually talking while doing it. No big deal. <laughs> so, uh, I'm uh, obviously I'm curious. What's the highest score? What are we up to now? I'm in 903. What was, were you, Kevin? You mean you were one point off? I was a 901. So I'm a 902. All right. And, uh, and Jovan, Jovan, I think, Jovan Dawkins, uh, uh, producer, session guy out of California, I think he was he was in the upper upper eights. Um, Jesse yep. Jesse Shelley, we had him on last week. He hasn't got back to us with a, with a score yet, so we'll have, to, we'll have to lean on him a little bit. It's like, hey, man, we got to get Jesse. his names in there. <laughs> we're coming for <laughs> you. Get us the score. I didn't. I missed a couple beats too because I was figuring out like which key to press, and I was like, "Oh, it's probably just space bar." <laughs> yeah, it's, it ends up being. I think it'll yeah. be just any key when you do it, but it is definitely a fun game. It's one of those things where you start messing with it and you do it once, and you're like, "Oh, well, now I got to do it again." Yeah, you want you want you want to you want to do it again? You want to do it again real quick, dude, with no distractions? All right, sure. Get a get a get a fair score here. All right, let's do it. Here we go. Eight ninety. There we go. Nice. A little better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're we're all not machines, so you know, it's like if somebody <laughs> if somebody says like, oh, I got a nine seventy two, it's like, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> You're not a drum machine. <laughs> You're a liar. <laughs> that is pretty addicting, though. It is. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I came across it and I was like, oh, this is this. We got to do this. This is a great time. <laughs> nice, nice, absolutely. I'm also getting well, uh, amped up on caffeine, so. <laughs> Okay, there we go. There we go. Is it coffee or is it energy drinks? Uh, coffee, black coffee. Oh, good deal. Good to hear. I'm the same way. What what brand are you drinking? I got some Pete's Major Dickinson's. Not familiar. Very nice. Not familiar. Pete's as in P E E T apostrophe S. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's it's good. It's like their flagship blend, I guess, but it's good. Now, are you like totally in the oh. coffee connoisseur, where like your kitchen looks like a Looks like a, a a lab where you got all the beakers. And... <laughs> no, no, not so much. <laughs> yeah, as long as it just doesn't taste awful, then I'm pretty much into it. Yeah, right. Something about us us drummers with coffee. It seems like all of us like it. I was I was I was watching a thing, and I mean, Garth's guy. I think he his kitchen looks like uh, looks like a, a, a chemistry Starbucks. lab. It's like, what are you doing? Are you making coffee or are you making something else here? <laughs> <laughs> Nice. To each their own. Yeah, Zach is the barista at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of our team guys. <laughs> yes, and we and we are seriously always chatting about who can make the strongest coffee with their French press. It's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> I got to get on the cold brew thing, man. Zach keeps yeah, Zach keeps telling us we got a cold brew. I do it every day, man. Living off cold. I brew. got into it uh, a couple years ago. John Henry, the Darkest Hour singer recommended it and it was you know a hot summer day so it did the trick and okay. uh, yeah depending on where i'm going to be like if i'm not going to be in an air-conditioned environment or like in my car then i'll opt for an, a cold brew yeah so I definitely it's good yeah it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to hard to drink that warm coffee on a hot summer day yeah <laughs> i know what you mean i know exactly what you mean well, from there, I think I think we're going to get into our rapid singles here, and, uh, and and like Richard told you before we got started, you know these are kind of these are kind of meant to be just kind of, most of them are just quick one sentence kind of things, and uh, just trying to get some some info out to some drummers out there that probably like to hear some of this. So, if you're ready, we'll uh, we'll kick it off with the first uh, rapid single. All right, I will try to be as succinct as possible. <laughs> Well, the first question is going to be, what was one thing that was holding you back from being a successful drummer before you kind of really, you know, got to that level where it's like, okay, man, these doors are open and I'm just moving on. What was like one thing you could say that you really had to kind of overcome to get there? 
undoubtedly a lousy time. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and did you work with that just by shedding with a metronome? Yep, pretty much. Yeah. Just, just, just get those metronomes out, guys. Even, even if you don't like to. <laughs> oh yeah, the, get married to it as soon as possible. It's important, especially when you're doing session work like you do. Oh, it's yeah. I live well. I it live rules here. the world, man. It does it really does? Someone once gave me a tip to go to sleep with a metronome playing in my ear. And I did it, and it was very interesting how it, 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 it was kind of advantages the next day. I found, I found myself playing a little bit tighter as I did it more often. I, I think I would wake up tired. <laughs> <laughs> I read a story about uh, Trey Cool from Green Day doing that. Oh, really? And uh, hopefully my memory isn't failing me, but I think one time he fell asleep to the wrong BPM, and then he was off like the entire day. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he like pre-programmed himself. That's fun. Yeah, we gotta find that. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, I guess we're tricking your circadian. <laughs> <laughs> Getting on to question number two here, we'll go. Uh, what What was the best piece of, uh, of advice you've ever received? You know, related to drumming. Hmm. I guess someone telling me in an unrestrained way that my time was not good. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> well, I had that, but I also had feedback uh, simply from recording myself. So you were able to hear kind of what, what was going on there, too. and then Yeah. Kind of start to yeah. correct yourself. So really, yeah. the, ti the timing is really, you know, a big thing for both those first questions. Mm -hmm. Let that be a lesson to you, drummers. Get the metronomes out, even if it's <laughs> painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just I, I kind of want to touch on that. When you say that you know you, you you did videos and stuff, would you say that that advice was more of a collection of different feedback from multiple artists saying, "Hey, work on the timing," that really collectively got you to focus on it, or just one person? It was one. It was the drummer in particular that he was older, and uh, he was a mutual friend, and uh, kind of had a, a bit of a. A following i don't want to say his name but <laughs> no worries. but uh yeah he he there was a misunderstanding and uh he apparently thought that that i thought that i was uh you know some hot shit and he wanted to <laughs> he wanted to burst my little bubble and uh between him saying that and the raw feedback from uh, you know playback from recording myself I, I could see that i had a lot of work to do yeah well, that's that's good stuff. I mean, that's it's hard, got, but you know, yeah. you gotta you gotta you gotta hear it. You gotta go through it. You gotta make those adjustments. Well, and that's like one thing I look at now too is is getting that honest advice. Like it's it's so tough to get somebody to to kind of honestly answer you sometimes. You know what I mean? You know, you go, oh, no, how how did I sound tonight? Oh, you sounded great. And it's like, did I really though, or are you just saying that? You know what I mean? You really you want that <laughs> truth, but then sometimes when you get it, it's sometimes hard to swallow too. Sure. Well, I guess getting into the next question here, um, well, three here. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success as a drummer? Discipline. Ah, uh, great answer. <laughs> One thing I think a lot of guys who want to get better lack, and then uh, you know they complain that they don't get any better, but they don't have the discipline to sit down and do the tough things. I have a pretty voracious work ethic um i i could never carve out an entire day where i just sit on my ass and you know watch movies it's just not me <laughs> yeah yeah you feel like you're wasting time yeah i know that feeling <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to i just i gotta agree that's with you feeling. same way no time for that shit that's good stuff now this you know these last few gets questions start to get a little bit more more specific, but uh, next one, number four here, we've got share a resource or a tool that helps you survive as a drummer. Well, since we've harped on time so much, <laughs> rather, than, rather than a metronome, I'm going to, I'm going to offer something different. Um, okay. Get yourself a mixer, a cheap little Mackie four channel mixer and a, a cheap microphone an SM57 will do and a couple cables, and you can patch all that into your metronome 
presuming that it has the applicable uh, inputs. Mm -hmm. And then now you have a mic to kick drum interfacing with your metronome. And that will clean up your bass drum playing like nothing else. Interesting. That's uh, that's really cool. I've never that's heard awesome. anything like that. And that's a really great yeah. idea. That is a great tip. That is a great tip. <laughs> Very cool. And that's and that's why we have Travis Orban on. You see, folks, <laughs> for those kind of things. Value bomb. <laughs> and uh, let's see here, number five, and and being a guy that reads, I you know I I think you could definitely give some good input on this. Is if you could recommend just one book, you know, book on drumming, what would it be and why? That's a tough one. Is it? <clears throat> I'm going to go comprehensive with this. Okay. Uh, Frank Briggs put out a book called The Modern Drum Set back in, uh, I think it was the maybe early 90s, mid 90s. Okay. But uh, that's a great book. It has, it touches on everything from, okay. I don't know, from reading and sticking exercises to advanced concepts, you know, metric modulation, polyrhythms, superimposition different styles of music. Uh, and at this point, I think he even put out a DVD uh, so you could get like the book and the DVD companion. So that's... Okay. Uh, and, and those are still in public, that's a still in publication, easy to find today? Pretty, pretty sure. I haven't looked okay. for it in a while, but uh, it's a pretty known book, so definitely. I'd venture to say that it is. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely link. We'll definitely find some links to it and throw them in the show notes here too, so uh, so folks can check that out. Because I mean, I, I you know, I've, like I said, I'm your age, and and I've been you know, I my parents were musicians. I started young, and I've seen a lot of books that I'm not I'm not at all familiar with that one. So I'm definitely just you know on a personal level, I'm on. I want to go check this out now. So that's yeah, great. Cool. I, I've been through it, you know, on a regular kit and a left-handed kit. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. And then, and that's a neat idea too. Once you finish this book right-handed. Go back yeah. and start again. <laughs> yep, you yeah. can do that. I mean, there's books to me are open ended. Like it's not this is what you play and that's it. You know, you can do so much with it. Uh, I, I one of my favorite things when I was getting some of my double bass skills together was to take the book Master Studies by Joe Morello and mm -hmm. work work through that with my feet with like a just oh, a yeah. sim simple backbeat on top. That was that brought me endless amount of joy. <laughs> Yeah, now that's and and that's challenging stuff to do because I mean the hand studies are pretty challenging anyways. When you start applying them to the feet, it gets even more fun, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can play anything though, except for press roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gets a little tough. That gets a little <laughs> tough. I mean, I, I you know I've liked to do make variations on uh, on syncopation, syncopation for the modern drummer. It's another great one to do that with. You know, you could do sure. so many different things with it. Absolutely. All right, now on to our last rapid singles question and this one is a little bit more in depth this kind of is going to put you out in a scenario and uh it's kind of different you got to imagine like you know the, this it's like totally taking you out of this world kind of so imagine if you woke up tomorrow in a world exactly like ours and you still had the same knowledge and, and skills that you have as a drummer but you don't know anybody you know you you got a place to stay you're in the town you want to be in you know you don't have to worry about room and board or anything but all you have is about 500 bucks a smartphone and a small portable drum set. What would you do from there? <laughs> mm. That's that's a that's an interesting kind of obscure question. Um, right. I guess look for people to play with. Yeah. And go to the the town venue and see what's happening just start networking then yeah networking and obviously i have to get a job at some point so <laughs> oh that's true that's true but uh, that's that's all i can think of i mean and well you, you know you, and you got some money to play with you got a five you know you got 500 bucks and you got a smartphone at least so you know hopefully that bill's paid so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right um so just networking, I mean, that's really, you would just start and just networking, you know, going to venues, going to shows, just meeting people, talking to people. Yeah. I don't have a very creative answer. That's the first that's thing okay. I can think of. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's important. We've definitely had drummers kind of touch on that, you know, in that question that, you know, you just, you got to get out there and you got to start 
you know, getting in people's faces and, and just meeting people. You know, some other good things that we've heard too is, you know, take the 500 bucks and maybe find a, a, you know, find a cheap used laptop or something and get a couple cheap microphones to be able to do some videoing or something to put your name out there a little bit more. And, you know, yeah. So, and so. But if you go to the club, maybe you'll run into someone who has their own studio and you can that's start, true. start doing work out Damn. of there. Touche. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I, I was I was thinking about how you answered that question too. It's like you know a lot of drummers were like, "I'll just get the phone and start recording myself." But you know, it's it's and and maybe I'm I'm coming from the wrong angle here, but I feel like because you 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 really take a lot of a t- time and appreciation to the way your drums sound, you wouldn't really want to go off and do that, and you would be searching for that guy who has that studio to session out of. Yeah, I'm, I don't know, the whole you touched on something, and it just made me think about like this whole phone phenomenon and. I don't know. I just can't get into like Instagram drum videos. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't move me. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't look good. I want as real as I can get, you know? Sure. So I, that's why I don't really post that sort of thing. Yeah. I'd rather but, but when you do a drum video, I mean, honestly, when you do a drum video, the, the quality is there. You know, we can see what you're doing pretty, pretty clearly. So, you know, for course, a guy, you know, you're at, not at your watching. stage. You're not watching on the screen that's four inches big, you know? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I would rather people take the time and watch it on YouTube. Yeah. No, that is true. That's definitely understandable. And, and I got to say, Travis, I've kind of, over the last few years, taken a serious page from that book where, you know, when Instagram really popped off with video and all these big apps came out, I was, like, filming myself play pretty live raw drums and... After a while, I started to notice that I had a distaste for that sound. Like, no matter what, I just didn't feel it. So, I, you know, I, I don't mind the smaller screen so much, but, I mean, 60 or 70% of people are viewing all this stuff on mobile devices these days anyway, so you like, kind of can't get past it, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I'm just, but you uh, do miss out on some of the detail. I mean, it's a lot different than you're watching when you're watching absolutely. it on a, on a 46-inch TV or, or even, yeah. on, even on, a bigger, you know, on a bigger laptop. I just I just look at it as it's art. It deserves to be respected, and it should be presented in a, a way that's uh, easily digest. Not easily, but best digested, best consumed. And to me, that that isn't a phone, but that's my opinion. And that's you know well, that's what that's why we like having a lot of different drummers on here to get those opinions and Absolutely. and to put those thoughts in other drummers' minds. You know, I think there's. There's a lot of people right now that feel like, you know, the only way they're going to get known is if they make a hundred million videos that, you know, everybody's going to watch them on their phone and they're going to get a call from, you know, from, from their favorite band that's going to want to hire them. But, you know, if yeah. it doesn't, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't exactly work like that. So, <laughs> and, and I, I would also argue that there's always going to be a fine wine approach to these kind of things where there's a million drummers right now doing, you know, 50,000 damn videos on Instagram. But there aren't a million Travis Orbins or that nature of people that are like, look, I'm only going to do this on a platform that best represents who I am and how I feel about the art. And uh, there's, I think there's something really important to be said about that and a really, really good stand up for that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, people can do whatever they want. I'm, I'm not some arbiter of taste, but, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't – you're not going to see me with an Instagram profile that says a new drum video every week. And, right. and then you're not going to see me with a YouTube profile that says a new cover song every week. That's just not me. Never has been and never will be. Sure. Yeah. Cool, yeah, and, and when you do put out stuff, it's you, you know, doing your session work, doing the stuff that you've been busy creating. So, yeah. And even like the town in which I live, um, this is more of like a tourist kind of resort town. And there are cover bands aplenty. <laughs> and I could have joined a cover band years ago and, and made pretty good money but sure. I, it was always in my interest to to make original music and i've always sought that yeah well i can relate to that because i did that for a while but it really wasn't out of out of any you know any specific reason to really want to you know play cover music it was the fact that uh well i got this house and i have a daughter and and if i'm going to do this i need to be able to put money in my pocket to support it as well so you know that kind of was a contributing factor which i think you know that probably falls into a lot of different drummers categories you know what i mean we're just you just can't, oh, yeah. can't do it 
can't do everything quite like that. So, you, you know, and, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, you're playing at least three times a month. You're playing for four hours at a time. You're covering a lot of music and it's a good time. But but you're right. It's a lot different playing your own stuff and creating. Just depends on what you want to do. You know, yep. you could you could definitely induce some sort of challenge in that. You know, you could set up a left handing kit and play the entire set like that, for instance. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's different it's, ways to, you know, derive some joy out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, and there's a handful of cover songs that are fun to play. You know, they're fun just to, just to, you know, groove it and play it. So, you know, yeah. To each their own. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that pretty much sums it up kind of on the rapid singles here. So it kind of just brings us into our last, last segment, so to speak. And it's just kind of a segment for you to, uh, you know, if you want to plug anybody, if you want to give, you know, the hi mom or, uh, or anything like that, you know, we, uh, <laughs> this is your time to do whatever you want to say. Um, I guess I'll just mention everything that's on the docket right now, as far as sessions and projects and everything. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're a busy I'm, guy, dude. <laughs> I'm, without exaggeration, uh, the busiest I've ever been in my career. Uh, like, as far as session bookings go, it's just, right now, it just feels like endless. But Because uh, I'm definitely, I'm booked well into next year at this point. But, uh, That's great. But, I mean, it's great, uh, it's great for us because we, we get to enjoy a lot more of your drumming, so. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, and I'm thankful for that. But, so anyway, I, I am... I started on the next Diet and Gray full length. I started that, I think it was last month. I will be finished that by the end of the year. I just did a single for a band named Time Winder, and I did the first song that will be on a, I believe it's a six song EP for this project called Instar. Uh, just finished the Barricades at Night full length, which I've mentioned them a couple times throughout this. Um, I'm getting ready to do Darkest Hour, of course, my actual band, not a session. <laughs> yeah, right. And then following that, I have the rest of this band named Aurora. They're based out of Florida. I'm doing their five-song EP. I have a single for this solo artist named Robar, R-O-B-A-R. It'll be my third single for him. Uh, I'm starting a full length with my longtime associate, Justin Bonfini, who is co-writing with a guy from a band called Burning the Day. Um, doing a full length for them. I'm doing a full length for a solo artist named Davey Lyon. Uh, there's another project. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Infinitesima. But uh, that's like avant-garde extreme metal, I guess. <laughs> oh, wow. That'll, that'll keep you busy. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, as far as uh, more personal projects, my fourth solo EP should hopefully be out before the end of the year. And I'm working on a side project, which started as a session for me, called Logical Fallacies. <laughs> and uh, that's basically, it's like we're kind of like the next Mr. Bungle, I guess. <laughs> okay. There's okay. No, <laughs> no holds barred. Anything that wishes to be expressed can be. And... Uh, uh, and then there's one more session, which I can't put a name on right now, but it will be surfacing very soon. But uh, this one in particular, I'm especially uh, honored to be a part of because the artist is someone who I've followed and kind of quietly admired for over a decade. Okay. Okay. So I think that's everything. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, man. Richard, um, Richard I think I you had something to throw in there, too. I just I gotta pop it in there, man. Is is there any chance of you and Zach Ordway ever doing anything again? Have you guys do you guys still chat frequently, or is it it just kind of like nah, never gonna happen again? <laughs> I would love to work with Zach again uh, in any sort of medium, but uh, I saw him earlier this year. Uh, Darkest Hour did a small run of Texas dates, and he came out for a gig in Fort Worth. First time I've seen him in, God, I think since 2011. But uh, he's just kind of, uh, he's kind of taking it easy. Um, he does some guitar session work. He works a lot with uh, Louis DeBook, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, who 
I was briefly in a band with him called Of Legends. <clears throat> oh, 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 I remember that. I dude, I, I love that album that you guys put out. I love oh, that thank album. you. The drums yeah, are Lu- so fun, dude. Louis, uh, <laughs> Louis is very focused on his, his new projects called Mystery Skulls, and uh, Zach contributes some guitar noodles in that. <laughs> and uh, so between the oddball session gig and that. I think he's staying pretty busy, but I would love to do anything with him, you know, solo stuff or another Skype's airplane record, whatever. I'm up for it. You guys just make a great musical couple. I just have always felt that way that it just all he's he's he, uh, you know, you're both different breeds of musician. And when two people really come together and create a sound like you have, especially when that that sound of symmetry record came out i just really feel like you helped define the percussion side of it whereas i always kind of looked at the drums in sky it's airplane as like a very it, it's just programmed by nature that's just the sound of sky it's airplane but you actually brought a really strong vibe of feel to the the record you actually tracked to and you know i really appreciated it I, i'd love to hear it again thank you um zach really sky well that whole self-titled album is really a giant expression of zach he was the main creative force behind that. He even programmed all the drums. Uh, The drums are live. They were played by Kenny Schick, but uh, Zach wrote all the drum parts. So you did sound of symmetry though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were, he's definitely a guy that I click with musically. Uh, Just whatever he does, whether it's more of in a progressive vein or, or rock or whatever like he's just we we get each other so yeah i would obviously love to work with him again cool. that's awesome cool. well we are uh we're never, gonna say get never. That. never say yeah, never never yeah that's right, that's right. fingers crossed richard and you let's get let's to, you're gonna get it travis <laughs> we're gonna get, the, get it we're gonna get the petition together just just wait we're gonna get the we're gonna we're getting we're getting the signatures we're gonna get the mass following we're bringing it back petition the indiegogo it's all it's all live by the end of the week <laughs> yep we got it it's coming look out <laughs> awesome man so before we cut this off uh, i just want you to let our users know where they can find you online travisorban.com that's the hub that's the hub travisorban.com cool you'll see a link in our show notes for sure that'll take you to youtube twitter instagram uh I have a Facebook fan page as well. It's Excellent. run by my friend Anthony. If anyone wants to check that out, I don't run it, but yeah, it, uh, I, we, Anthony and I, we are in direct contact, and I, you know, tell him what content to post and everything. Good deal. Good deal. Awesome. Well, we'll have all that in the show notes. We'll have the, the link to uh, to Orban dot com, and, and great. People know how to find you. Cool. Very cool. Awesome, man. Well, I think that uh, I think this went awesome, and uh, I, I just got to say once again, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming on the Drummers I Like podcast and uh, spending an hour chatting with Kevin and I. It was a pleasure. Anytime. Yeah, it, was, it was. It was definitely our pleasure, man. It's great to have you on, and uh, and a guy as as well versed as you, and and uh, and as as um, legendary in the drum community right now, man. I mean, you know, yeah. people can't get oh. enough enough uh, Orban, you know. Oh shucks. <laughs> really, uh, it's honor, man. Thanks yeah, again. Yeah. And um, when you uh, are coming through Florida or um, LA, we will make sure to get in touch and come out and do some live videos of you if you're down. Yeah, that sounds fun. Cool. Definitely. Awesome, dude. Well, uh, we will be in touch and uh, hope to hear again from you soon. All right. I'll Thanks, see you guys man. later. We'll All see right, you. Travis. Take care. See you. That was freaking awesome, and that was Travis Orban, guys. The one, the only, the legend, the myth, the real deal. You just heard him. Kevin, that went freaking awesome. How'd it go for you? Oh, I mean, you were there, buddy. I mean, there's no other way to say that. That was just, that was a great show. Uh, you know, Travis is a, is a great guy to talk to, as, uh, as most of our guests are. I don't think we've had any bad guests, but, but uh, you know, a guy of his caliber that's, you know, that's got the skill set that he has, um, it's just amazing. And, and we got some awesome knowledge, I mean, you know, in rapid singles, you know, talking about yep. the metronome stuff. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think of Travis Orban, they're like, oh, well, this guy, you know, he popped out of the womb and started playing sessions, right? And it's like to hear him be like, I had to struggle and get better, you know, with my time, you know, and, you know, let's let's have all those drummers out there know that, hey, man, you know, 
He had, uh, he had the same issues that some of us have right now, but he had the discipline to work through them and took advice from, you know, from drummers and, and, you know, went through books, tried different techniques, worked with the metronome and, and, you know, and, and his, his work ethic and discipline is what got, what has gotten him to where he's at now. And I think a lot of drummers need to take, take that, you know, and, uh, and see how they can apply it to themselves to, uh, to improve their own drumming. Yeah, you, you really are a product of your environment, and he made him he really made sure that everything he did was you know really 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 disciplined. Like you said, he's very disciplined. He's very strict. You know, I can imagine that his regimens have been insane, and that your average drummer probably just can't keep up with the amount of practice he's probably doing to get to that skill set that he's at. Yeah, definitely, definitely yeah. agree. Nice to uh, nice to hear. Just it's just nice to hear someone like him be so grounded with all this. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, and, and it was great to have him on, you know, and I just want to mention again too, not related to Orban, but, but drummers out there listening to this, you know, if you just enjoyed this show with Travis Orban, please stop by, give us a review. It's going to help everything, you know, get on there. You know, if you can't think of a good review to give us and uh, just go on there and list some drummers you want to see on the show or anything, just go on there, give us a star rating. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know who you want to hear from. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to be working on getting those guys booked. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I can't even press that enough, guys. Get on over and uh, give us a review. And, uh, you know, if you do give us a review, you will probably get a sticker pack. The first 50 reviews will get a sticker pack. So, you know, we haven't plugged that lately, but that's still going. And along with that is, once again, I got to plug it, man, the $25 Amazon gift card contest, which we've deemed the Who's Kit Is That contest. Which it's really simple. You head on over to drummersilike.net. You'll see our nice post on that, really explaining the full detail of rules because it's very detailed, but not too detailed. Enough for you guys to really be able to get involved in this contest and not just take the simple route of getting entries, but a couple different ways for you to really win that twenty-five dollar gift card. But go on over to the website, check it out. We also got a nice posting on it over on our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which you can find us as at drummers I like for the Twitter and Instagram handles and Facebook.com forward slash drummers I like for of course the Facebook handle and on YouTube you hit us up at drummers I like if you want to do the podcast there of course it's also on all your podcasting apps officially on the Play Store on the iTunes podcast Stitcher and anything else that you might be listening to podcasts on so go subscribe and right now I'm going to give you five minutes to pause the podcast and go give us a freaking review because we're going to give you a pat on the back for it so pause it go give a review and uh yeah we'll definitely um make cadence and a little room next week to talk about our favorite reviews and kind of point out who went out there and made the time to let us know how they feel about the show because you know your reviews and uh, your feedback is going to really help shape the future episodes it also f- helps drummers find us you know what i mean there's there yeah. definitely uh definitely a lot of guys that want to hear you know what these drummers have to say and and gain a little bit of knowledge from guys that are uh, very successful in the craft that we all love so absolutely you know. SEO muscle is definitely uh, tight over here at Drummers I Like, if you're wondering. But we definitely need everyone to spread the word because that's the truth. That's how you get the, get the uh, movement out there. And uh, we definitely feel like Drummers I Like and the Drummers I Like podcast is a different approach to the industry and to the way things are kind of done. So, you know, with your help, we can kind of get this thing out there and spread our message and our, our voices worldwide. Absolutely. Yeah, so I plugged everything. You guys know what to do next. Go and listen to the other episodes of Drummers I Like podcast <laughs> and uh, enjoy these uh, these great interviews that we have because they're very insightful and you can learn a lot. You really can. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm done, I'm done plugging everything Drummers I Like, and I got to give a big shout-out to Zach, to Tyler, and to Brendan. Not Brandon. <laughs> Brendan. Sorry, guys. When I introed our new boy, Bren- Brendan, last week, I made the mistake of calling him Brandon. So – my bad, and uh, slap in the face to me. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Shame <laughs> big, on you, Richard. Shame on you. <laughs> and as usual, man, a big thanks to you, Kevin. Can't do it without you. Really can't. Um, I, I thanks to you, Richard, too. That, that, that feeling is mutual, and, uh, and can't wait to do it again next week. Yep, next week we're bringing on another awesome guest and following another awesome guest and another awesome guest. and uh, It's just freaking awesome. I'm excited, and I hope you guys are, too, because we've got so many good guests coming So come on back for a listen. We'll talk to you guys later. Thanks again, Kevin. All right. Thanks again, Richard, and good night, everybody.